Hi everybody, it's Professor Miller. This lecture is going to cover the alterations for male reproductive system. It does coordinate with chapter 34 in your textbook. Um, so first we'll discuss a little bit um, about disorders of the urethra. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, um, like cystitis and infections or urethritis is a lot more common in women because of um, the anatomy. However, men can also have, um, you know, cystitis, urethritis, or prostatitis um, as well. Um, with urethritis, remember anything that ends in ITIS usually is an inflammatory process. Um, so usually there's like inflammation of the urethra. Um, a lot of times in men, um, you know, symptoms of like cystitis or urethritis is caused from um, typically a sexually transmitted infection. It's not always the case. We can't always assume this, but um, we're, you know, we're really suspicious or highly suspicious of it. So we always will send out a culture to make sure that we identify the bacteria. Once again, the most common cause would be like a gonorrhea or chlamydia. So when it says non-gonococcal, that means chlamydia. Um, and, and it can be other atypical bacteria, but most commonly it's either gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, and this is may, you know, they may present this way. So they may not necessarily have discharge or anything like that. They may have more symptoms of like a bladder infection. Um, other issues too, it's very common for infections to occur after any type of urologic procedure. So if they had any kind of surgery or a scope, anything that was introduced into the urethra can obviously introduce bacteria, um, which then can cause an infection. Um, in, insertion of foreign objects, so if they had a full catheter or they're doing straight cath, um, you know, they're just more apt to developing an infection there as well. Anatomic abnormalities, that would be something like a stricture in the area. It just predisposes them to inflammation and then um, secondary infection as well, or trauma. Um, you know, and usually that's more related if they had a procedure done. Um, so it's not uncommon following like a procedure or surgery or catheter for, um, unfortunately, for infections to occur. Um, urethral strictures, um, this is basically, when you think of a stricture, basically it's narrowing. Um, and a lot of times it's due to um, scar tissue development. So whether they have a chronic history of infections there or they had a lot of urologic procedures that were done, um, you know, usually there's some kind of history there that would um, lead to a, you know, a stricture of the area. Um, but the big thing is that, you know, when we, even when we talked about renal failure or acute kidney failure, um, you know, we talked about like post-obstructive renal failure. So it's the same kind of concept here. If they have you know, obstruction in the urethra and urine can't flow, it backs up and they can get hydronephrosis or they can end up with um, acute kidney failure. And obviously that would have to be very severe or prolonged. Um, usually it would re be reversed before something like that would happen. Um, but that's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Um, other disorders of the penis, physmosis and paraphysmosis. I'll show you an image on the next slide. Um, but with physmosis, it's basically the foreskin is, you, they can't retract the foreskin essentially from the glands of the penis. Um, and I'll show you on the image, but from distal to proximal. A lot of times it's related to like a chronic um, infection or, you know, a history of chronic infections. And usually it's um, the infection underneath the foreskin. And they develop scar tissue there. So then, unfortunately, they it, they don't retract the foreskin and then, you know, they can develop uh, paraphysmosis. Um, these patients, obviously, if they have, you know, a lot of scar tissue buildup or, you know, chronic state of infection, because it's kind of hard to treat after, you know, it becomes chronic, um, they may require a circumcision. Paraphysmosis, um, it's basically the inability to replace or cover the glands with the foreskin from proximal to distal. So it's the opposite. Um, but the big thing, this is a surgical emergency because it can um, actually cause tissue necrosis of the penis because it can reduce circulation to um, the penis, essentially. Um, so this really is a surgical emergency if they are unable to um, move the uh, foreskin forward, essentially. Um, I'll show you an image on the next slide. But um, So this would be like physmosis and paraphysmosis. So it's the opposite. So they are unable to pull it forward, but we worry about tissue necrosis here. And um, so that would be a, like a urologic um, emergency, and they would have to um, do a circumcision in that patient. And this is the opposite, like they are unable to retract it, essentially. Um, other disorders that are fairly common in men, um, this would be from HPV. So this is genital warts or condyloma, what we, you know, the technical term for it. Um, and remember that HPV, there's multiple strains. There's tons of different strains. And even like the HPV vaccine covers... Um, Gosh, I believe it's like 
15 or 16 strains. There's even more than that, but they try to target the ones that are most most problematic. Most problematic. Um, numbers 16 and 11 are the ones that cause external genital warts. In the, actually, out of all of them, the ones that cause external genital warts are actually a lot more benign. Um, you know, in, in men, but in women, there's certain ones that have um, the more potential or higher potential of causing cervical cancer. So there's certain strains that are more problematic than others. Um, in in this case, um, it's more of a um, like a cosmetic issue. Um, but a lot of times they have to have surgery or laser therapy to kind of remove the areas. There is creams, but um, you know, it just kind of depends on how well the patient is being treated or if they're, you know, sometimes it's easier just to have them do a um, laser therapy. Um, so this is what condyloma looks like. It typically, the, you'll hear the term like a cauliflower-like appearance. So they'll usually kind of cluster and they kind of look like little cauliflower type growths. Um, so this is external genital warts essentially, which is caused from HPV. Um, Disorders of the scrotum, this is actually very common as a varicocele, um, and essentially what this is is like um, varicosities, essentially, with by the testicular area. It's more common on that left side, um, and sometimes you'll hear the term bag of worms, um, basically just because there's a lot of um, varicosities in the area, and it almost has like a heavy feeling to the patient. Like They'll say that they complain of like a heaviness in their um, testicle uh, area, or in the scrotal area. Um, but basically, it's like a varicose veins or multiple varicose veins there. Um, and usually they're benign, um, but some patients will complain of, you know, pain with it if they do a lot of activity. Um, it's usually developed like in young adulthood or adolescence. There really, there's not an underlying um, cause or risk factor there that they can really um, pinpoint with it. Um, but a lot of times... Usually it's just treatment with like um, making sure that they're feeling well-fitting underwear with, you know, scrotal support that, um, you know, the patient has essentially with that. If it's very severe and it's like causing a lot of pain, sometimes they'll do surgery with it, but that's relatively rare. Um, I'll show you some images. I think I have it on another slide. Um, hydrocele, you'll see this commonly actually in like the pediatric population. I saw it a lot in when I worked in the NICU. Um, cause a lot of times those babies are born prematurely. So a lot of, you know, their organ development is, um, is still not quite on track. Um, but a hydrocele essentially is where they have fluid, um, in between the areas right around the testicle essentially. So their testicle will look enlarged. Um, and when you hear the term trans illumination, essentially that's illuminating it with a light. So if they were to take like a, a light or a flashlight, and like I said, you'll see this commonly in a baby. Um, and sometimes, and they tend to go away as the baby gets older, um, but a lot of times, like I said, you can, they'll transilluminate it and they'll see a lot of fluid around the testicle essentially with it. Um, so it is common in kids or little kids. Um, usually they outgrow it, but, um, it can be caused from an infection or any type of trauma or torsion in the adult male. Um, so anything, in, you know, causes inflammation. So think back to when we talked about even inflammation, um, you get all that aggregate of fluid, white cells, all of that. So it's swelling essentially. So that's what happens, you know, if there was an infection or trauma to the area. Um, essentially a hydrocele means just fluid or water around the testicle. Um, a, a spermatocele is basically more um, in a concise area. Basically it's by the epididymis, which I'll show you an image on the next slide. Um, but it's usually more of like a mass that's felt um, and it's it's distinct from the testes. So it's not surrounding the entire testes. It's basically in one area around it. And a lot of times it's painless. So the patient really won't complain of it or won't even notice it until they feel um, a mass there. But usually it's mobile, meaning that it'll move, um, but typically firm. This is um, an image of a hydrocele, like I mentioned before. So it's just fluid around there. Um, a varicocele. So what happens is these um, spermatic veins essentially get engorged with um, blood, essentially. So it's like a varicosity. So they have a lot of blood that pulls in that area, um, but it can present with pain in the, in the testicle or groin area. Um, so like I said, a lot of times with this, it's more of like support of the testicle to kind of take the pressure off those veins and stuff. And this is a, this is the same thing, a varicocele here. And it kind of looks like this on the outside. So um, a lot of times they say it looks like a bag of worms um, and it feels kind of heavy. One thing that you got to make sure you um, are aware of, because um, this is another urologic emergency, is uh, testicular torsion. Um, what happens with this is they 
the testicle actually twists or turns. But what happens is that it twists upon that spermatic cord and it also um, twists upon um, arterial flow. So what can happen, unfortunately, is there can be necrosis to the, te the testicle. So obviously, as soon as it's picked up, and usually they're in severe pain, but um, a lot of times it'll be like a presentation in the ER um, where they have, you know, testicular pain on one side. Um, they'll do an ultrasound, um, but we want to prevent, obviously, from having uh, tissue necrosis. So it's usually a surgical emergency. They'll take the patient in, obviously, to make sure that, you know, it's released essentially there. But that's one thing that you got to be aware of with um, acute testicular pain. Um, there is what they call like a testicular appendage or like a torsion of that appendage. It's much different than torsion of the testes because this is basically just a tiny little area of there. And they don't, it's not a urologic emergency. I mean, obviously they present with pain with this, but usually it's treated with rest, ice, anti-inflammatories. Um, whereas when I talked about the testicular torsion, that would be the complete lack of blood flow going to the testicle. Um, and the other thing with that, too, is they're at huge risk for developing um, infertility after that. Um, well, and plus, they could potentially lose a testicle, if, obviously, if it was necrotic, but um, which then affects fertility and all that, too. So um, basically, the big thing you remember is that it can cause tissue necrosis of the testicle. It interrupts the blood supply, um, but usually... Um, it kind of is spontaneous. It'll basically, and it seems like you see a lot in younger adolescent, younger adult. Um, usually there's some kind of physical exertion usually before um, preceding it, um, but it's usually spontaneous. So there's really not anything that kind of um, necessarily triggers it, um, but it is a surgical emergency. Um I already mentioned the appendage. It's basically like, a, it almost is like a little appendix that kind of comes off the side there. Um, but what happens is that they get inflammation there and then obviously they can have a lot of pain in that area too. Um, orchitis is basically acute inflammation of the testes. So once again, they're going to pre present with, um, you know, a lot of pain in the testicle area. Um, there's a lot of inflammation. There's a lot of swelling with it. Um, but this, the most common cause is for mumps. Um, and obviously now that we vaccinate the mumps, although we've had a lot of new recent cases, but, um, in boys, I mean, you worry about this. It's pretty common. I would say that I think it's right around 20% of adolescent boys that get mumps develop orchitis, which is um, essentially, you know, significant swelling and inflammation um, by the testicle, essentially. But usually they're ill, like, because a lot of times it's related to a bacterial infection or another virus. Um, typically mumps, you'll see it in a lot. Um, but once again, it can cause infertility, if it's, especially if it's bilateral. If you have you know, if you lose testicular function on both sides, it's obviously more problematic. Um, but they present with a lot of tenderness, a lot of edema, redness. Um, a lot of times they're just generally ill. Like you may have a high fever with it too. And it's pretty sudden onset. Um, and obviously the treatment, if it's viral, I mean, you, it's supportive care. Um, you know, you can't treat a viral infection. So it's kind of like uh, you have to kind of, there's really not much you can do. Unless it's a bacterial infection, obviously, then you, it's treated differently. Um, another thing, too, to be aware of is cancer of the testicle, um, testicular cancer. Unfortunately, it's um, more common in the younger adult male. Um, so this would be patients that are, like, in their, you know, anywhere from late teens to middle age. Um, so it's a younger population of men that it's more prominent in. Um but a lot of times it's painless, so they won't have any issues or they don't, um, you know, present with pain, but they may just notice that it looks enlarged or it's larger than normal. Um, and the big thing is making sure that they get in for an ultrasound, obviously, too, to kind of um, to make sure they're, you know, it's being looked at essentially with an ultrasound. And treatment depends on, um, you know, if it's progressive or if it's spread to lymph nodes. Um, obviously, it depends on, um, you know, how the patient presents with that. I just added this because the two common cancers, you know, for reproductive for men is either testicular in the young adult or prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is very, very common. You'll see that a lot in the older adult male. And a lot of times prostate cancer, it's pretty treatable. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't progress too significantly now because they do treat it pretty well. But um, let me just go through this really quick. But 
with testicular cancer, like I said, it's usually more prevalent between like a 15 and 40 year old male. Um, family, uh, family history is another significant factor there. Anybody that's been obviously previous diagnosed, they're at more risk. Um, if they have a history of undescended testes, meaning that um, they were born with their testes that were not essentially descended, they're still higher up by the abdomen. Um, and a lot of times they'll descend as the, you know, as they get older, but um, they are at higher risk for that. Um, so usually it's the younger male. Whereas prostate cancer is obviously prost uh, cancer of the prostate, um, which is a different part. Um, and I'll show you more images, but um, it's obviously more common as men age. Um, there's a significant um, link with family history, um, ethnicity. Um, there is a higher occurrence in African American males. Um, so there is a link there. And believe it or not, there's a lot of genetic linking there too. And they've actually looked into like the um, the BRCA um, one and two, you know, that we look at for breast cancer. And there's actually been links with that too, with um, prostate cancer too. So um, there's a genetic component obviously there too. Um, we'll talk about that too, because I have it at towards the end. But um, in terms of one more thing with epididymitis, basically, this is more in the testicle area. Once again, your epididymis is basically on the top of um, the top portion of the testes, essentially, on both sides. Um, but a lot of times, once again, they with patients like this, they present with a lot of scrotal pain with it, and they may have urinary symptoms with it too. But a lot of times, once again, it's related to a uh, sexually transmitted organism. Not always, but it, um, especially in the younger male that's sexually active. Um, it definitely can be from gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, so basically a lot of times it reaches through the epididymis through um, the ascending um, vas deferens, which is right here. Where is it? Uh, right here. Because um, obviously all of this links back up through your urethra, it goes through the bladder, um, your, it basically backflows and they can get epididymitis. So they get an infection and inflation, infate, inflammation, sorry, um, of the epididymis. Um, and it's treated essentially if they have an infection, usually like they'll do a urinary culture um, to see what kind of bacteria it is and all that. Um, and obviously it's treat, treatment's dependent upon that. Um, so BPH, this is very, very common, super common in men. <clears throat> um, it's benign prosthetic hyperplasia, or you'll hear benign prosthetic hypertrophy. In fact, I almost hear hypertrophy more so than hyperplasia, but you'll hear the term BPH used. Um, so essentially all it is is an enlargement of the prostate gland, um, but they do have, it's problematic for men. Like a lot of times they'll present with symptoms such as um, a decreased flow, like they'll have a weak stream, or sometimes they present with um, the decreased ability to start a urine stream. Um, so a lot of times it's urinary symptoms that they complain with, with this. Um, it does have a relationship with aging, so it's obviously more common as men get older. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, too, they've changed some of this, too, with, like, PSA screening, but they've always done, um, after the age of 50, they'll do, like, a PSA level, and it's done through the blood, like a serum level, and they'll, um, this is for prostate cancer that they're looking at. So they'll look at trends in the PSA um, and if it becomes really elevated, um, then obviously you look for, um, you know, you worry about prostate cancer. Um, but digital rectal exams obviously were um, always done for screening purposes because with, um, from the rectal area, just the positioning of the prostate, um, essentially that's where you can um, feel it or do an exam essentially through the rectal area. Um, but this is really common. So a lot of men are on medications that will help shrink the prostate. Um, whether they're like an alpha um, blocker, which you'll talk about in farm, um, or other androgen type uh, anti-androgen agents. So basically to kind of help shrink the prostate there. Um, and a lot of it's to, um, you know, help with symptoms essentially with the patient. So this is a, just an example, um, normal prostate with, with um, an enlarged prostate. So this is the bladder. And obviously, like I mentioned, the urethra comes right through there. So that's why they present with a lot of urinary symptoms. So that's why they have a uh, weak flow or um, a hard time initiating a stream because um, obviously they have compression there from it. Um, you can get what you call prostatitis, which is basically anytime you see itis at the end, it's usually an inflammatory type reaction or and usually it's related to an infection. Um, but once again, it's related to like an ascending infection from the urinary tract. So basically, it's all connected. All that's connected. So 
basically can backflow um, into the basically prostate. Um, but a lot of times they present with urinary symptoms with this. Um, sometimes they may even have pelvic pain with it. They may have um, flank pain, like it presents with pyelonephritis. Because remember, pyelonephritis is of the kidneys, and they present more with like a flank pain in the back. Um, once again, they would do like a urinary culture um, to check, um, you know, the type of bacteria and all that and the sensitivity. Um, it does present relatively acute with this a category one. Unfortunately, there are patients that develop it chronically, um, and they can't, unfortunately, they'll keep getting it. Um, and I think I have that on the next slide. Yeah, so chronic, um, so they basically get, keep getting reoccurring urinary tract symptoms. A lot of times, um, a urologist will manage these patients um, because obviously it becomes more problematic as they continue to get them. Um, so they keep persistently having bacteria in that area as well. Um, similar to symptoms of a bladder infection. So a lot of times, again, they present with those same symptoms of like a bladder infection with it. Um, but unfortunately, they can get changes or more inflammation or enlargement of that prostate gland because of all these infections as well. Um, sometimes they actually have to do like a surgical in intervention, um, unfortunately, to uh, permanently cure it, essentially. Um, cancer of the prostate, um, as I mentioned, it's very common in the older adult male. It's the second most common cancer in men. Um, it does have a very good prognosis. So like I said, a lot of times um, these patients will do very well. Um, and a lot of times they're asymptomatic until it's relatively advanced. Um, other risk factors like besides family history, um, dietary factors, like things that um, a lot of red meats they've linked it with, or like you know a high intake of red meats or um, high fatty diet. Um, hormones, if that's a good point, like when you get to pharmacology, like things like testosterone, if you have a patient that takes testosterone for like um, decreased libido or low t low testosterone levels in the male, it's very common as men age, at the, it's kind of like a, ma a male menopause type thing where they have low um, decreased testosterone levels, but putting them on testosterone, it's kind of like the breast cancer thing, like where you don't want them on estrogen because it can kind of feed into this. Same type of thing with um, testosterone. Um, we'll always look at their PSA levels to make sure that it's not rising because it can put them at higher risk for um, prostate cancer. Um, previous history of vasectomy, they've kind of linked that with it too. Um, chronic inflammation, so if they have chronic prostatitis, they're at higher risk as well. 95% um, are adenocarcinomas. So remember when I talked about adenocarcinomas are basically um, tumors that originate from glandular tissue essentially. Um, I already mentioned family history is very common. We do, the, in terms of laboratory values, it would be the PSA. So we're looking at a prostate-specific antigen test. Um, it's not precise. It's a screening tool. So it's not a yes or no, black or white answer. Um, so the big thing is that with these, we look at trends. So if you had a patient that has been at 3.5 or 3.8 for 10 or 15 years and it's been that way, it's not that concerning. If you have a patient that's, you know, been at a 1.0, and all of a sudden they're at six or seven, you know, that's when we should, you know, look at things. And it's not necessarily always prostate cancer. It's not very, you know, it's not specific just to that, um, you know, because prostatitis or other things can actually cause it to increase as well. Um, but PSA is the lab that you would look at for this. Um, in a digital rectal exam, essentially, too, because like I mentioned before, the prostate basically lies right here by the bladder, um, but the rectal area is here. So a lot of times if they do a prostate exam, you can feel the prostate from the rectal area. Um, and you can tell if it's enlarged or if it's boggy feeling or, um, you know, like basically it might feel like there's like cystic or nodules on it or something like that too. Um, I do not expect you to know the different stages. I just want you to know about, um, you know, like the symptoms and what we look at in terms of labs and, and that stuff. Um, in terms of evaluation and treatment, um, like I already mentioned, your DRE and the PSA test. Um, treatment really truly depends on the age and the health of an individual. And this kind of goes along with a lot of different chronic disease states as well. You know, you have to look at the age of the patient and how old are they. If they're, you know, in their 90s or they're 92 or they have a lot of chronic health conditions, you know, the treatment can vary based upon, um, you know, the patient's health status. Um, it's obviously stage of the neoplasm, um, anticipated effects. So these are all discussions that really have to be made with, um, with the patient. 
Um, cause some patients, they prefer no treatment because sometimes they're very slow growing or they've been there for a long time and they're not having symptoms. Um, there's surgical treatments. Um, sometimes they'll do what they call a TERP, um, where they go in and remove part of the prostate tissue. There can be radiation, hormone therapy, I'm sorry, hormone therapy or chemotherapy, immunotherapy, which is basically, um, almost like a chemotherapy that is targeting certain portions of the immune system. Um, Real quickly, in terms of STIs or STDs, um, some of the, and obviously there's certain STIs that are what we call reportable. So things like that would be like your, like an HIV, hepatitis B, um, things are, you're supposed to report them essentially like to the county and they usually keep track of it and all that um, in terms of infections. But there's a lot of STIs that um, we do not report. Most of them I would say you do not report. Um, so you just might hear that in the future about reportable infections, essentially. Um, but the big thing, like we talked about in women, there's complications, you know, with women, we talked about pelvic inflammatory disease. So it can spread essentially into the pelvic area and then they're at risk for, um, you know, infertility or they're at risk for tubules, um, or ectopic pregnancy, essentially, or chronic pelvic pain. Um, a lot of infections are also related to neonatal morbidity and mortality, so that's why exactly why, like, if you have a mom that's pregnant, everybody is screened. Like, they should be screened for gonorrhea. They should be screened for chlamydia because a lot of times they don't know they have these underlying infections. They're screened for HIV because obviously these things can affect um, pregnancy or, you know, they can be transmitted to the baby depending on what it is, um, whether it's like HIV or herpes or something like that. Um, you know, if it's gonorrhea and chlamydia, it's treatable. Um, but they can, they're at risk for preterm labor with stuff like that. Um, genital cancer, you know, things like HPV, that's been linked a lot with different cancers. Um, synergy with HIV transmission. Um, this happens like syphilis or HIV can be um, present together um, or hepatitis and HIV. Um, so obviously, too, that's why a lot of times when we're screening, we screen for multiple STIs. Although the, um, the majority of STIs can be treated, you have to remember that the viral STIs are basically considered incurable. So things like HPV, um, herpes, um, hepatitis, all of those are viruses, so you can't treat them. Um, you know, like in herpes, they have a lot of antivirals that the patient can take, you know, to kind of keep them at bay, but these will never go away. So it's always in the patient's system, um, so obviously that's why prevention is important. Um, other just different ones like gonorrhea, we kind of talked about that. Um, in terms of with other, bacterial vaginosis is not really considered a STD, to be honest. Um, that would be, that's usually, that's obviously found in a female, um, but women can have bacterial infections that are not STDs. Um, but syphilis is another one. Chlamydia is obviously another one. Um, but viral, like I mentioned, these are not curable, like genital to herpes, HPV, HIV, those things like that. Um, and there are parasitic type um, infections, so like trichomonas, that's a um, parasite. Um, scabies, um, these are usually external, like on the skin that they'll get that, um, but they can get scabies in the genital area. Um, pediculosis basically is lice, so you can get pubic lice. I mean, it basically can go anywhere where there's hair. Um, so these are just other STI, STIs, essentially. Um, so they will conclude the lecture on um, the male reproductive track. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.